So let's begin. This is actually class four, and that's because we're circling back. And we're looking at the early church. Which is, of course, the book of Acts church. The early church. All right, a couple of Greek words. Anybody want to try that word? Try to spell it in Greek. <laughs> Delta, Upsilon, Du, Dune, Dune Mus, Dune Miss, actually. Dune Miss. Sometimes it's pronounced Do the Mus, but it's Do the Miss. So the word dunamis, what does that sound like? Dynamite. dynamite. No, it is. That's where, that's where the word dynamite come, comes from. Dunamis. And it's the word for power. Power. Dunamis. All right. And then we have, of course, another word. Anybody wants, wants to try and smell? Not smell the word, but spell the word. Eat? Nos. It's actually ethnos. Ethnos. And the word ethnos is actually nations. What's the, what's the Hebrew word for nations? Goyim. Goyim, or we know as Gentiles. Right. Gentiles. Gentiles. <laughs> Is that right? That's a missing an e. All right, Gentiles, or, or in the Hebrew, it's goyim. I'm not sure how the actual word Gentiles, now that you mentioned that, came into existence. I'll have to look that up. But the actual Hebrew word is goyim. Well, it's Italian. It could be Latin, but goim, goim is the actual Hebrew. It, it does sound Latin. It does sound, all right, so the nations, ethnos in Greek. So the period here that we're looking at here for the book of Acts is 33 AD to about 60 AD. So you have about uh, 27 years of duration during the time of the book of Acts, when the book of Acts were, were compiled, put together, and so on. So the book of Acts, we're going to consider the book of Acts in three categories or three sections. Could I take this down? You guys are like, sure, please do. All right. Do the miss. Now remember that word, do the miss. For power, we'll be looking at that in a few minutes. Then... We'll get to, uh, to, the, to the, the message of Peter. All right, so now you, we're going to consider the book of Acts in three categories and, again, three sections. The first, the first part of the book of Acts, 
deals with the empowerment. There's that word. I'm going to extend it. Empowermentation. Empowermentation. Empowerment is good enough. The empowerment. And what else? And the initiation. church. That's the first part of the book of Acts, and we're talking about possibly Acts chapter 1 to about Acts chapter 4. Right, yeah, that's about right. Acts chapter 1 to 4 is dealing with the empowerment of the church. The second category of the book of Acts is Yeah, the expansion and the expansion and the inclusion, uh, the expansion of the church. This deals with the growth of the church in, in Jerusalem. And the inclusion. of the Gentiles. That's, let's see, that's about, uh, that's right around Acts chapter 4 to 15. Right, so Acts chapter 4 no, <laughs> Acts chapter 1 to 4. Acts chapter 4 to 15 deals with the inclusion of the Gentiles into the church, and the church expands. Acts chapter, now this, the third part of the third section of the book of Acts we're going to be looking at is, of course, the ministry of Paul. And this will take us to the end of the book of Acts. Of course, you're talking about Acts chapter 16 to 22. Is there 22 chapters in the book of Acts? Someone tell me. Twenty-eight. Twenty-eight. Wow. I was off by many. So this is, the, this is how we're going to look at the book of Acts in three categories. Initiation. Initiation. Okay. T. All right. Okay, so, yes, so you prefer a T. All right. A C would work for me, but. So, this is how we're going to look at the book of Acts. Hopefully, by by maybe by the end of the night tonight, we'll finish up the second category. We'll see. We may not get that far, but we'll see. But by the end of next week, we want to get to the end of the book of Acts. Now, the book of Acts probably deserves four or five classes if we're going to look at all of the different aspects of the book of Acts. But we're not going to have the time to do that, so we're just going to, you know, two classes, take a quick look at the book of Acts, and look at what's really important and relevant for us, and then we'll move forward. Okay? So following the book of Acts, we'll begin to look at the letters, the letters of the apostles. And that will, of course, take us to the end of the course. So let's begin. We're going to begin by looking at the empowerment and the initiation of the church. So the church is initially empowered. Once it becomes empowered by the Holy Spirit, 
then it's initiated for the work of ministry. Without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, there's no opportunity for ministry. And that's true on a broad, on a broad scale uh, for any church. Certainly was the truth for the, was the reality for the first century church. It's also true for every believer. We will not have ministry unless we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. And that's the picture of the Book of Acts church being filled with the Holy Spirit or baptized in the Holy Spirit before its ministry actually is initiated. Right? And, and Jesus makes that vividly, vividly clear for us that without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you will not have ministry. And we'll see that again here in a few moments. So, let's begin to look at this. So, in, 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 in Acts chapter 1, we're going to look at Jesus' ascension and his final statements to the church before he ascends. His final statements are very, very relevant and important for us as believers, and it does, in fact, relate strongly to what I just said a moment ago. So let's look at this. His ascension, of course, where did he ascend to? To the right hand of God, where he sits as, uh, as God's right hand, God's number one. When we studied in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 4, we saw that he sits at the right hand of God and all power and authority has been given unto him. And there he is, he is carrying out the work of redemption on behalf of God. So let's read, uh, let's read in Acts, Acts chapter 1. I'm going to read 1 to 11. And this is the full scope of the text as it relates to the ascension. So let's read. The first, now this is, of course, we know that Luke wrote the book of Acts. The first account I composed Theophilus. Who is Theophilus? Theophilus is not a person. Theophilus, Theo, Theoph, Theophilus refers to the, to the church in general, lovers of God, those who loves, those who loves God about all that Jesus had began to teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the, to the apostles whom he had chosen. So he's speaking here to the apostles. Um, the apostles are gathered together with him on the Mount of Olives. He's about to ascend. Now, there may, there may have been other believers there at the time, but he is addressing the early church, the apostles the apostles whom he had chosen. To, to these, he also uh, presented himself alive after his suffering by many conviction, convicting proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning what? The kingdom of God, which is the gospel of the kingdom of God. All right, so he continued to teach them concerning the kingdom of God. And what we're going to see here is that as a result of him teaching and preaching the message of the kingdom of God, their perspective or perspectives are geared towards the kingdom of God because of the question that we're about to see. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you've heard from me. So what did God promise? The, Son, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Uh, when did he make that promise? during the Passover meal. He made that promise during Pesach that they would receive the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit was with them. They would come on occasion when the Holy Spirit would be within them. This is the promise. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So Jesus was referring to uh, what will occur 10 days following this particular event. Uh, time. He was about to ascend 40 days after he had resurrected. 50 days after he resurrected, first fruits would have been 49 days and, or seven weeks and one day would have been Shavuot. So 10 days following this event, they were going to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. All right? So when, when they had come together, 
they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it that this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? That question comes from his teachings concerning the kingdom of God. Because he taught them, even after he resurrected the message of the kingdom, they are fully expecting that this would be it. All right. and how did he respond? So he probably actually reminded them of this because he did say this to them. Right? Uh, uh, two or three days before the cross, he gave the Olivet Discourse. And in Matthew chapter 24, he said it. No one knows the time or the hour <clears throat> concerning the coming of the Son of Man. Now, they ask him a second time, well, is it now? You've been preaching the message of the kingdom of God, right? Which is a little bit of a different message that, that we have today in the church. What we have today in the church, the, the gospel of salvation only, right? As we said before, salvation is a, is a very important gospel of salvation, a very important message, but his message is the kingdom of God. So he continues to teach the message of the kingdom of God, so much so that the disciples are saying, well, is it now? And what did he say? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed in his own authority. So no one knows, not even the Son, as he said back in Matthew chapter 24. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria, even to the, remote, the remotest parts of the earth. So, you will receive power, Dudamus, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Then, once you receive the power, you will be my witnesses, here in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Now, we think of a witness, right? We think of uh, someone standing on a street corner, or going to Walmart and witnessing to someone. That's not what the word is. The word is actually mathuro. You will be my martyrs. The ones who will lay down their lives, die to themselves, and live to me. It's the only way you can be a, a testimony of Jesus, a witness of him. You can, you can reflect him. By, by laying down your life, because he himself laid down his life. And I'm not referring to his physical life. I'm not saying that we must go to the cross as well. But he purposely denied himself, his self-life, denied it, and lived solely to the kingdom of God. That's the crucified life. And to be a witness, a, math, a, a mathuro, you have to do the same. That's how you follow Jesus. You're not going to live to yourself and follow him, right? They're not mutually compatible, right? So you must lay your life down. You must expect, well, walk in that self-crucifixion, and you will be his witnesses. Now, the witnesses will be, that witness will begin in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then ultimately it will expand into all the world. It will expand, but it will also contract. The contraction I'm talking about is when the church returns to Jerusalem, the place of its origin, the place of its destiny. So there's an expansion and there's also a contraction. So the empowerment is what the church is awaiting. That's true for every church. Every church should have that testimony, that experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit, now, question, how can a church be filled with the Holy Spirit? We know how a believer can be filled with the Holy Spirit. How can a body of believers, a church, be filled with the Holy Spirit? Can such a thing happen? Now, I'm not talking about, you know, 50 or 100 or 200 people in a room all having a Pentecostal experience. I'm talking about as it was on the day of, the, of, of Pentecost, when the 120 were as one man, they were all united in one place, and they were all then filled with the Holy Spirit. One event, not 120 people being filled with the Holy Spirit, but they were as one body of people. So is that possible? Yep, absolutely. Every church should have that type of experience 
when as a unit or as one body of people, the Holy Spirit comes within them. That's different from each person being filled with the Holy Spirit. But each person must be filled with the Holy Spirit in order for you to be empowered to be a witness, a servant, a martyr, a martyr of Jesus. And, and as a matter of fact, the church has the same responsibility. Every church has that same responsibility. It's the way by which a church will serve in the kingdom, in God's kingdom, that that church will then have that same testimony and experience. So a question, when does a church have that experience of in unity, in one, in one accord, as they were in the book of Acts, when do they have that experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit? When they consecrate themselves, when they purpose themselves towards body worship. Body worship, not just worship as a, of, of 100 individuals, but worship as one individual, 100 people. That's when, that's when it happens. Is that, is that clear or did I convolute, it, convolute that whole issue? Is clear? All right. So now let's read on. After he had said these things, verse, 10, verse 9, he, lifted, he was lifted up while they were looking, at, looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So he was ascended at that time. As they were gazing, in, uh, gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood besides them. So I guess suddenly two men in white clothing shows up. They also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will in, this, in, in just the same way as you have watched him, well, excuse me, let me read it again. This Jesus who has, a, who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you, have, as you have watched him go into heaven. So the same way that he went up, he will return. Actually, in the, same, in, in the exact same location, he will descend. So this is the ascension of Jesus. And this is a very important event because... Here is where he made clear to his church what's necessary for them to become his witnesses, to become his servants. They have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. They have to be empowered. Right? So it doesn't matter how you shake this out. If you're Pentecostal, if you're Methodist, Messianic, whatever you are, the empowerment by the Holy Spirit is not optional. It is absolutely essential in order for you to serve in the kingdom of God and to become a witness, right? So this is the ascension. Any questions on the ascension? How do we know he's going to be coming back in the same place and not follow? Because of Zechariah chapter 14. <laughs> Zechariah chapter 14 is very vivid. Uh, there are a couple of ways by which we know that that's the place of his return. But in Zechariah chapter 14, it says it there that the Lord will appear and he will land, his feet will land upon the Mount of Olives. Also, in Ezekiel, when we studied in Ezekiel, the, 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 the presence of God, the Shekinah glory, the Kavod Yehovah, ascended from the Mount of Olives and ascended into heaven. And then Ezekiel see, sees in his vision, his final vision, the glory of God, the Shekinah glory, returning to the temple, but it descends upon the Mount of Olives. In the same way it went, in Ezekiel's vision, in the same way it returns. So we're talking here about the glory of God. What does that have to do with Jesus? Well, someone tell me, what does the glory of God ascending from the Mount of Olives and descending on the Mount of Olives, what does that have to do with Jesus? The right. But Ezekiel had the vision of the glory of God departing the temple. And it, the last time it's seen is on the Mount of Olives. So it goes up from the Mount of Olives. He also has the vision of the glory of God returning to the temple. It, it's first seen again on the Mount of Olives. And then it returns to the temple. So what does this have to do with Jesus and the coming of Jesus? Okay. <laughs> 
Right. So when the church is resurrected, resurrected, every believer will be filled with the glory of God. The Shekinah glory, the glory of God will be in us. And so the picture that Ezekiel saw, the vision that Ezekiel saw, was the return of Jesus to the Mount of Olives as he comes with, with the church, the living temple. All right? The glory of God returns with the church. We've, we've, went, we've been over this many, many times. All right. So let's now begin to look at the day of Pentecost. Uh, it's amazing that following, following this, this event on the Mount of Olives, um, the disciples now are sort of grappling to see who's going to lead, who's going to take a position of leadership. And Peter seems to be at the front of it. He seems to be taking uh, precedence over the disciples to some extent. But nothing like when the 10 days is up, or 10 days are up, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit occurs, because then Peter, empowered by the Holy Spirit, begins to really minister. He's now not just Peter who had foot and mouth syndrome, but Peter who would, in fact, preach with power. Right? And this is, this is Peter's uh, Pentecostal experience. I think the entire church, the 120 that were in the upper room, would have all had that experience where they were in, in, immediately empowered to minister. But you see it very vividly initially in Peter. Why? Because Peter gets up and preaches. And he preaches with power and revelation and understanding, which can only mean that he, he, he received that enlightenment and that empowerment. So the truth is, all that Peter began to preach on that day was the revelation and insight that he had received during the three years of following Jesus had been stored up in him. You know, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will bring to light, like we studied last week, will bring to light all that I have said to you. So Peter now believes it, and so on the day of Pentecost, he receives the Holy Spirit, and suddenly the Holy Spirit is quickening in him everything that Jesus had said in the, in the last three years. So this happened in the upper room. Now, there's a tradition in regards to where the upper room is. Have you been there? No? It's dubious, right? The building that's there right now, there's about a 99% chance that that's not the actual building. But the location might very well be the right location. According to, according to tradition and according to archaeology, that's probably right about where the upper room was. We don't know for sure, but, but there's good, good argument to say that that's where it was. And then that room was later built uh, on the spot. We don't know. But anyway, I, I like that little area right there in Jerusalem. Mount, it's actually Mount Zion, right? Where, the upper, room, where, the, where the, the upper room is supposed to be if you go there today. It's a nice little area enclave in Jerusalem where... And next time, next time we go, I, I do, I, I do want to take folks to that upper room thing and go through that whole experience. But uh, so the upper room is where this, this happened. 120, you often wonder, how can 120 people fit in that little room? It was big, yeah, same room. Still, it's not big enough from, from my, our perspective to fit 120 people. They'll be, they'll be pretty tight in that room. So 120 are there, and what happens? They're all praying, it's Shavuot. Uh, the tradition of the Jewish people during Shavuot is to do just that, to pray. To pray, and they pray, and they pray all night, and they wait on God. And, and so this is what they're doing, and as they're doing this, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. So let's read about that. Who would like to read? I just did a little reading. Someone else, if you can, read for us, if you would, please. Acts chapter 2, 1 to 13. Who wants the honor of reading this? Acts chapter 2, 1 to 13. Anyone? Thank you. 
Phrygia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Somehow we made fun of them and said they had had too much fun. <laughs> Full of sweet wine. So this is uh, this is the the empowerment of the church, and it's manifested in power, right? So so tongues of fire descended upon the believers, and everyone was there praising God in tongues and the Spirit, as we would say. So I'm not sure if we need to spend time talking about praying in the Spirit or the whole gift of tongues thing. I mean, how do we feel about that? Are we comfortable about it or are we are we in a place where we have tons of questions about the gifts of the spirit as it relates to the gift of tongues because this is where everyone sort of gets themselves all worked up right so what how do we feel about tongues the gift of tongues i should say um, i'm sorry i have a question uh-huh everyone came by Well, it's right. so it's really impossible for 120 people to speak in, let's say they're speaking in, how many different nations are mentioned here? About 15. Let's say 120 of them, you divide 120 into 15, that's how many? 120 into 15 is 11 or something? Eight, or something like that. So let's say you have, you have eight people speaking one language, eight people speaking another language. The argument is that they will actually speak in the languages of the Cretans and the people from Pamphylia and, and Phrygia and so on. Let's say that's actually what was happening. What would that sound like if you had 120 people uh, speak in 15 different languages, eight people per language. How confusing would that be? What do you think the chances are that you'll recognize anything? Right? I mean, you just hear a babble. You, you just hear uh, just a racket of noise. But this was not natural. This was supernatural. So the Cretans and the Pamphylians and so on, all, all of the people that were there, they were hearing the word of God being spoken in their own. So what, 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 what was actually happening was they were receiving interpretation, which is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, of the tongues that were being spoken. That was a supernatural act that God, that God at that time produced. Because he wanted to, God wanted to prove that these men were actually spiritually gifted. So all of these visitors, all of these pilgrims to Jerusalem were here in their own language. So they had, they had received, and this can only be by the Holy Spirit, interpretation of the tongues. So, yes? Okay, so when you, when, you, when you think of diverse tongues, it's referring to languages, okay? Nevertheless, diverse tongues can be uh, the gift of tongues because in, in, in my experience, there is no one set language. In other words, there is no one set of articulation of words. Each person has, has a gift well, the gift of tongues, 
And some of the words are, are close, some of the words are identical, but it's applied differently in each person's life. So in each person's experience. So diverse tongues can be 20 people praying in tongues, or it can be 20 people speaking in different languages. Biblically, it can be both. But there are times when the gift of tongues, referring to diverse tongues, is referring to the gift of tongues. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul speaks of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit being diverse tongues, diversity of tongues. Well, that's the prayer language, gift of tongues. If I pray in the language of angels and men and so, you know, the heaven, angelic language and so on. So the angelic language is what we think of as the gift of tongues or what, what we call our prayer language. So, so this is highly controversial in, in all of Christianity, right? So you, you, you speak to Roman Catholics about the gift of tongues. I think their official position is that that gift went away with the apostolic church. They may even go further and say, well, if you're a saint, then perhaps you may have the gift of tongues. Uh, because the saints are spiritual, the common believer isn't. But they, would t they take the position that with the apostolic church, the gifts of the Holy Spirit had been restricted or taken away from the common believers. Much of Protestantism, the Protestant church, also takes the same position that the perpetuity of the gifts of the Holy Spirit does not exist. Now, of course, the Pentecostal church, or the, what's called the full gospel church, or the Pentecostal church, we, we're convinced that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are still for the church, and the gift of tongues is a valid and needed necessary gift. The gift of tongues is something you have to experience yourself to understand the power of the gift of tongues. If you, if, you, if you are negative about it, you'll never receive it. Uh, let me just say it that way. If you, if you have a, a great reservation about the gift of tongues, well, just be content that you will never have the gift of tongues. Uh, if you're open to the gift of tongues and you desire the gift of tongues and you pray for the gift of tongues, you will likely receive it. Now, the gift of tongues is a bit different from the other gifts. It is for the edification of the individual believer. It's also a sign, as in the case with the book of Acts, a sign to unbelievers. Now, Paul, speaking to the church at Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he says, if the church, if everyone prays in tongues, and the unbeliever comes in, and, and the one who doesn't believe in the gift of tongues, comes in, and there's no interpretation, it's confusion, and you don't, you don't have a witness effectively is what he said. So for that reason, when Paul said, when one pray in a tongue, in the, in the context of a church, let there be interpretation. He's, he's referring to, to order in the church, church order, or order dur during a church service worship. So when one prays in a tongue, there should be interpretation. Doesn't mean that when you pray privately or quietly in tongues that you need to interpret. You interpret only when it's audible, when, it's, when, you can, when it can be heard. For the sake of, for the sake of those that are, that are witnessing it, right? So I, I'm not going to try and do a survey, but the gift of tongues is absolutely legitimate. And I, I always say the gift of tongues is needed. And, and the gift of tongues is one of those gifts where you never, again, you never fully appreciate it or see the value of it until you have it and you understand the power that comes with it. That's when you truly uh, begin to believe it. It's one of those gifts. And the reason, again, for that is the gift is really about the edification, the building up of the individual in that regard. So the, gift, the, gift, the gifts of the Holy Spirit at this time or the power of the Holy Spirit came upon the church. Then... At that time, Peter, empowered by the Holy Spirit, he begins to minister. Uh, just about immediately, he begins to minister. All right, let's read about that. Acts chapter 2. He begins, actually, in Acts chapter 14. 
he gets up, once he realizes that the pilgrims were questioning what was happening, he begins to address them right away. Let's see, Acts, Acts chapter 2, I'm going to read 29 to 36. So by now he's into his message, he's already quoted from the prophets, from the Psalms, and so on. I'll pick it up in verse 29. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he, is both, he, has, that he both died and was buried and his tomb is, in, is with us to this day. And so, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath, that, with an oath to, to, to seat one of his descendants on, on, the, on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Messiah, and he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. He's referring to the psalm. I'm not sure what psalm exactly he's referring to. Um, 16? Psalm 16? All right, so he's referring to the psalm where David spoke about God not allowing his servant to see decay. So now in 32... This Jesus God raised, raised up again, to which we all witness. We are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemy a footstool for your feet. Therefore, therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you, cross, who you, whom you crucified. So this is how Jesus, uh, this is how Peter ends his message with a convicting note, and this convicting note was very important because following this, uh, the, many of the Israelites began to repent. And, of course, not the leadership that was responsible for sending Jesus to the cross, and the Romans, actually, as well. No, the, the, the people, the pilgrims that were there. Of course, they had three years of experience, all of the pilgrims uh, that came from different parts of the world at that time. They had three years of experience of hearing about Jesus. Some of them actually, actually would have beheld his his miracles and, and observe his ministry. So at this point, they're ready to accept. And many, many of them do accept. Again, not the high priest, not the ones who, again, put him to death. So again, Peter here goes on in the same, same chapter, is it? Yeah. Same chapter, 37 to 42. Oh, 47. Who wants to read a little bit for us? Uh, chapter 2, 37 to 47. Ten verses. Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins, turn to God, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ to show that you have received forgiveness for your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you and to your children and even to the Gentiles, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miracles, signs, and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. 
They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. So, as the church is empowered, the church begins to take shape, take form immediately. Peter is empowered. He gets up and he preaches immediately. There's conviction. 300 people are convicted and they make a decision about the Messiahship of Jesus. Now, this is, this is how the church is initiated with power in the Holy Spirit. And again, as was read there just now, immediately they begin to function as a body of people. They had no preparation necessarily to function as a community. This was, I believe, all by the work of the Holy Spirit in them. So as they began to function in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit led them to be a community. Prior to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they struggled to be 12 men in unity. We, know, we, we, we understand that, right? They were, they were at odds with each other quite frequently. Uh, Peter wanted to go fishing, others wanted to go here. And Jesus was so concerned about them the night before the cross that he was actually concerned that they were, going to, they were going to just be divided up. So following the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they began to coalesce, pull together uh, to become a community of believers. This is, in fact, the very first church. This is how a church ought to function. Now, you might say, well, that's a little bit extreme. <laughs> you know, they had everything in common. They were... They were, they were centralizing all of their resources. We don't, want to think, we don't want to think of a church in that light today, but that's how the Book of Acts church actually functioned. All right, and now what happens? At this time now, the church begins to be empowered more and more. Peter and the disciples now are manifesting gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the, the power of God is, is being manifest through them. Yes? Remember that they were all pilgrims, right? Meaning that they were all journeying from, from other places. So they had that moment of conviction, and 3,000 believed. How many people would have been in Jerusalem at that time? Half a million would have come for the, the, the festival of Shavuot. At least half a million, perhaps more. So you had one little, one little group, which is 3,000 people in one area that, that heard the message and, and they, they made a decision to believe that Jesus is in fact the Messiah. Now, I would say most of them went back to wherever they came from as believers. Whether or not they went off to established churches, I don't know. They didn't stay in Jerusalem. They were journeying. They were journeying to Jerusalem. You do know that, of course, three times a year, uh, men, sons, sons of Israel, men of the tribes of Israel will make journeys to Israel to, for Sukkot, uh, Pesach, and Shavuot. So it's possible that they went back to wherever they came from and God would have possibly used them to initiate churches or ministries. I, I, think, not, I think no, because I think the church had to be established first in Jerusalem. Uh, the, 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 the model of the church had to, be, had to be well established. And the apostles who worked in that first church would then go out to begin the process of, of establishing churches. But there were 3,000 believers that went out. All right? So we don't know if they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, possibly not. All right? But certainly they, they saw the power of God and they were open for every good thing that God would provide for them. So now, Peter now and the disciples are just empowered by the Holy Spirit. They're living in Jerusalem. They didn't go back to the Galilee. They're staying in Jerusalem and they're, they're going to the temple daily and praying at the temple and so on. On the way to the temple one day, something happens. What is it? They, they, they call out to Peter for prayer, and Peter, and then there's, there's healing. Jesus said, what, uh, Peter, Peter brought some dimension of healing. Uh, 
And what happened? Well, the, the uh, elders got, got, a, got, got wind of what had happened, and they come out to find out what was going on. The elders in Jerusalem, the, the, the Sanhedrin, actually, not the elders, the Sanhedrin, uh, they were very much in control, very much keeping everything under wraps in Jerusalem. And Peter begins to address, he begins to preach. So I want to read for that, I want to read for you now in chapter 3, this is Peter's address. He's addressing mostly the, the leaders that came out, the Sanhedrin. In, in Acts chapter 3, 11 to 26, while he was clinging to Peter, this is the person who was healed, and John, all the people ran together to them at the so-called portico of Solomon, full of amazement. You can go to Jerusalem today and see the portico of Solomon. It's one of the places I like to go when I go to Jerusalem. But when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if our own power or piety, uh, in our own power or piety, we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant, Jesus, the one whom you delivered uh, and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he, had the, when he had decided to release him. So he's preaching conviction again. Uh, he, he made the point that Pilate was prepared to release him because of his wife, who had a bad premonition, uh, but they persisted, the leadership did, persisted that Jesus should go to the cross. But to put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, and a fact to which we are witnesses. And, and, and on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. And the faith which, one, which comes through him uh, has given him this, this perfect health in the presence of all. Now, I want to I remind us here that Jesus became the Lamb of God on the behest of God. God sent him to the cross. All right, There was no way he was not going to die on the cross. So, but Peter is convicting here because of the rejection factor. Doesn't matter. They had to reject him. It was necessary that Israel would reject him and that he would, in fact, go to the cross. Now, 17 and on. And now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance, just as your rulers did also. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of the prophets that his Messiah would suffer, he, he thus fulfilled. So God has fulfilled what he promised in Isaiah chapter 53. Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Now, the time, the two, who has a different word for refreshing? Does anyone have a different word there in verse 19 than refreshing? Refreshment. Who has another word? <laughs> Everyone has refreshing? The word, the word there in the Greek uh, more, is more suitable to consolation. Refreshing is a good word, but I prefer the word consolation. I think that's what's in the King James. Consolation. That the consolation of Israel would come. The refreshing of Israel would come. So, He's asking Israel to repent. Of course, this would not happen. Israel was destined for diaspora. They were, they, were, they were set and ready to be driven out into the nations where they would make amends for their iniquity among the nations. But the time of refresh, so Peter has enough understanding to know that when there is repentance in Israel, the time of refreshing or the time of, of, uh, of consolation would come. All right? So he has that understanding. Peter is showing here that he has a, he has a greater appreciation of the, of, the, of the word of God, even of the prophets. He's beginning to cite the prophets. And that he may send Jesus, the Messiah appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of the restoration of all things, about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, 
from ancient times. So he understands well that heaven, that Jesus must sit at the right hand of God for a period of time until the restoration is complete. Now, Peter was obviously under the impression that the restoration was imminent based on Israel's repentance. But Israel would not repent sufficiently at that time because of God's purpose. It was not God's purpose that there would be repentance in Israel. That might sound a little odd to you, but it's the same situation with Jeremiah the prophet. When, Jer when, God, when God sent Jeremiah, when Jeremiah began to speak to Judah, there was no prospect for repentance. God did not look for repentance from Judah because God was prepared to execute his plan, his will, through dispersion, through the, the punishment that he had decided for Israel, for Judah. It's the same thing here with, with this period. God had determined to destroy Jerusalem and drive out the, the, the people of Israel into the diaspora, so repentance was not an option. But Peter, effectively, in essence, was correct. When Israel repents, they will have that time of refreshing, time of consolation, and then will come the restoration of Israel. So Peter didn't know that this would occur some 2,000 years later. So that's exactly where we are today. Israel has come to that place in the diaspora where there is repentance and, and the atonement for their sins has been met. And now they are restored to the land of Israel. There is some, some discomfort in the land of Israel, but God is restoring them. The restoration of Israel is upon us, and they are experiencing or beginning to experience the refreshing. All of the, all of the consolation that God said that he will place upon them, they are beginning to experience. Of course, the discomfort that they are experiencing now has to do with the nations. If the nations would back away and leave Israel alone, we will see nothing but prosperity and God's favor upon the people of Israel. The nations are afraid of this, of this, this, this visual of the people of Israel being tremendously blessed and prospering in the land of Israel. So they, they are there to create conflict. They are there to create another visual that Israel is, is a horrible nation. They are an apartheid nation. <laughs> and that always amuses me whenever I hear that Israel is an apartheid nation. And so, so that's the purpose of the nations, to, to prevent, to obscure the reality of the time that we live in relative to Israel, the time of the refreshing of all things, the time of the restoration. So Peter knew this time would come. He was expecting and hoping it would come a lot sooner, but lo and behold, at the end of Peter's ministry, when he wrote his three letters, it's evident in his three letters that he fully understood that this time of refreshing, the time of restoration, was in the distant future. And that's how, he wrote, that's how he wrote in regards to prophecy in his letters. He knew that he would die and that a very extended period of time would come before the restoration occurs. Because that's how, in his letters, he prepares the believers. He prepares the believers in his letters, mostly 1 Peter chapter 1, most, mostly 1 Peter chapter 3, I think it is, where he begins to prepare them for the long haul, for the great weight, for the diaspora. Because then he understood the fullness of what God was doing. But he's, he's understanding enough to know that the restoration of Israel will occur when there is national repentance. Just for information's sake, the national repentance that Peter was looking for has occurred. It, it didn't occur in one event. It occurred over a period of 400 years. Uh, the, the inquisition or the, the pogroms and all of the persecutions that came upon Israel with the forced conversions, the inquisition, and then, then the Nazi, Nazi terror, seven years of that, and it wasn't just the Nazis. The, the Soviet Union, the newly formed Soviet Union, killed about two million Jews as well. They were not backward in the slaughter of Jews themselves. Uh, the Ukraine, when the Soviet Union formed under Stalin, this was at the same time with Nazi Germany, uh, when the Soviet Union formed under Stalin, the Ukraine was, was a, a Jewish stronghold, what we call the Ukraine. Uh, very, very populous, Jewish populous nation. 
Well, immediately Stalin began to horribly persecute the Jews of the Ukraine. Uh, again, approximately, at least what we know, two million Jews died under Stalin. So all of this, all of this incredible uh, difficulty and persecution upon the Jewish nation uh, led up to ultimately what would be the, the restoration of Israel, the state of Israel coming, to it, coming into existence. But during that period, from the 1500s all the way up to World War II, the whole Soviet Union persecution, the Nazi persecution, during that period there was a tremendous cry among the Jewish people of the world for God's intervention and repentance. If, if, you, if you consider what the rabbis were saying during that period, they were all crying out and calling for national repentance. And God promised that they would have it at the end of the period of restoration, at uh, the end of the period of the diaspora. So, proof that Israel has been forgiven and that the atonement has been applied to the people of Israel is that they're back in the land, they are a nation again, God's favor is upon them, and the nations are prepared to destroy them. That in itself is proof positive that they have been atoned for. All right? So you say, wait a minute, that can't be right because they're not Christians. How can they be atoned for if they're not Christians? Well, that's a whole different perspective. That's a whole different point. But I would respond to that by simply saying they can be atoned for by Jesus without becoming Christians. I mean, I mean, just frankly, think about it. Who provided that any human being would be atoned? Or provided for, atoned for? Jesus. When did he do that? At the foundation of the world. And at the foundation of the world, atonement had been provided for every human being at that time. Even national atonement for the nation of Israel. Eventually, ultimately, the nations would be in a place of salvation all of the nations, would be in a place of receiving, I should say, universal salvation. You can see salvation on many levels, individual personal salvation, national salvation, and universal salvation. Yes, there is national salvation. Paul said that all of, the na that all of Israel will be saved. The nation of Israel will be saved. There is universal salvation, which will occur during the millennial kingdom. It is the blood of the Lamb that provided for every bit of each aspect of salvation. My personal salvation, the salvation of, of, of Israel, the ultimate salvation of this nation together with all the other nations. The blood of the Lamb. So atonement will be made. How, a question, this is, this is a good question, should clarify my point. How will the nations make atonement or make amends and be atoned for? What is the process by which God will bring the nation through to bring them to that point? Yeah, that, that's the manifestation of it. That's when we know for sure that the nations are saved. But there's a certain process that all of the nations will go through in order to come to that place of making amends for their iniquity. Israel had to go through that period. What period am I referring to? Judgment. 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 judgment, yes. So Israel had to experience the judgment of God, the chastisement of God, being driven out into the nations, from nation to nation, being persecuted, being dragged close to the point of extinction, and then they began to cry out to God, and, amends were, and God made amends and saved them. The same thing is going to happen with the nations. We call it the Great Tribulation. And we studied the book of Revelation, right? We saw that, yes, the nations, all the nations of the world will be brought to a critical point in God's judgment. Well, at some point, the nations will cry out. I think it's going to happen, of course, at the zenith of all this judgment that's coming, Revelation chapter 19, perhaps, but they will cry out, and they will see Jesus. All eyes will see him, and all of the nations will have national or international universal salvation. Again, that's the essence of the millennial kingdom. And that's when all of the nations from year to year will go to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacle. 
That again is the evidence that they are quote unquote saved. So, so Israel will be saved. And Peter understood this. It's obvious that he did. The timing he didn't have exactly correct. Of course, from Peter's perspective, he just received the baptism of the Holy Spirit months before, and he's looking for every good thing from God now. And that's how we all are when we're baptized in the Holy Spirit. We want it now. We want to see all of God's goodness, and we have that zeal going in us, and Peter had that. Uh, again, later on in life, he begins to tame himself a little bit and began to look out into the horizon. The fortunate thing about who we are and where we are is that we're on that horizon. We're standing on that horizon that Peter and the apostles gazed into. We are the ones who are there. So there's an honor, there's a certain uh, benefit from that, but it also means that we will see things that, that's not pleasant. We will see the great tribulation. If I don't, my, my, my children or their children or some generation not too far off in the future will see the great tribulation. But of course, they will also see the coming of Messiah. And they will see the glory of God. So, any questions? Yes. Okay, so when we study in, in Leviticus chapter 26, what God said will occur to Israel. And when we look also in Deuteronomy chapter 4, you know, Moses said, when you act with hostility against God, he will drive you out into the nations and you will be driven from place to place. You will worship, you'll be forced to worship idols, the work of man's hands, and so on. Yes, all of it. The pogroms, 500 years of forced conversions and inquisition, um, trial, and, and so everything that they experienced, and they experienced quite a bit, leads to the Nazi terror, uh, the Muslim terror, the Muslim uh, uh, pogroms against the Jewish people in Medina, in Mecca, and throughout the East. Horrible, horrible persecutions. Now, all of it was as a result of their iniquity. All of it was. Yeah. And that, that period in the diaspora was really, really horrible. They had no peace wherever they went. They had peace for a good period of time in Spain and Portugal, the Iberian Peninsula, they had wonderful, wonderful hundreds of years of peace that ultimately came to a crashing end, a horrible end. All right, but God, it was at the end of that period in Spain and Portugal that God, that God began to point once again to the land of Israel. So after the expulsion edict and Jews began to flee from Spain and Portugal, primarily, uh, is when God opened the way for Jerusalem and for the land of Israel to be the destination for the Jewish people once again. Of course, he used the Ottoman Empire. Right. So there's a lot of history behind that, that that we can get into, but not necessary. All right, so let's, let's read on about what Peter says to the leaders in Israel. Where did I stop? Repent and return. Da, 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 da. Restoration of all things. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. And it will be that every soul that does not heed the prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announce these days. It is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the, covenant of, and, and of the covenant which God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham and to his seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For you first, God raised up his servant and sent him to, to, sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. All right, so Peter, he is, he's a preacher. <laughs> he's a preacher, very convicting. Of course, very powerful. He's citing biblical references. He's keeping his 
his, uh, his, his, his dissertation in a biblical con uh, context, he's excellent. He's powerful, right? Uh, he's anointed. He's anointed. I, I venture to say that all that he had learned throughout his life as a fisherman in the Galilee and all that he had learned with Jesus, uh, the Holy Spirit had began to quicken in him. So every time he spoke, the Holy Spirit would, would erupt from him, right? So he's functioning in a few offices right here. He was functioning as the de facto pastor of the church. In fact, he was to be the pastor. He was also functioning as an apostle, an evangelist. He was preaching, and he was also a prophet. Because we see him here in his, in his presentation referring to prophecy. So here, all of a sudden, we are seeing almost every bit of the five-fold ministry working in Peter immediately as he's ministering to the people. All right, so this is Peter now. Peter is heavily anointed, and it's obvious for all to see. So from this time now, the church begins to bear fruit. It begins to, to grow and come into its own strength. Uh, Peter was no doubt the first pastor of the church. He meant to be the first pastor of the church, or the pastor of the church, first church, however you say it. He was certainly the leader. All right Now, when the situation happened with Ananias and Sapphira, it was Peter who addressed it. So clearly, Peter is functioning as the leader of the group, the shepherd, the pastor. What happened with Ananias and Sapphira? Any, anyone cares to speak about that? Most of us don't like to speak about it. <laughs> right? Uh, they, they didn't act congruently with what the Holy Spirit was doing, and uh, they died. Peter spoke death to both of them, and they both died. That's, that's pretty powerful. <laughs> Again, we prefer not even talk about it. it. It means that such a thing can happen. So what does that tell us? What do we take away from the story of Ananias and Sapphira? Obedience. Obedience to the Holy Spirit. Obedience to the Holy Spirit. I always take away from it that whenever God is doing something that's, that's powerful, that's building towards his kingdom, don't get in the way of it. Just don't get in the way of what he's doing because he is very zealous about his work and you get in the way, he might move you out of the way. Now, I've seen that personally myself. Not that people will die. I've seen that, but that's not so attractive, and I'm not going to talk about that. But I've seen people in context of what God is doing here at this little church. Um, this is my frame of reference here at this little church. I've seen them remove people, not kill them, but remove them. Uh, just you, you, get, you insist on getting in the way. You insist on trying to change things, <laughs> uh, applying your own efforts into the whole ministry thing. Then I'm going to remove you. I've seen it. It's not pleasant. I've seen it. So, so it's, it's something that God does. If God is in the work, in the process of doing something that's really relevant, and should be, that such a thing should be happening at every church, right? Every church should be involved in doing something that's very relevant to the establishment of the kingdom of God. And wherever, it's, wherever, it, wherever it is happening, do not get in the way of it. What should you do? If you're, in the, if you're in a church or you're in a ministry where God is doing something profound and something meaningful as it relates to the kingdom of God, what should you do? All right. Surrender your will. Yes. Get with his plan, right? Right become congruent with what he is doing, <laughs> fit in. Go along and, and do what, you know, Jesus said, I can only do what I see my father doing. Well, that's my confession, and that should be the confession of every believer. If, you know, this, our little church here, and it's, it's a very little church, but our little church here are encouraging the people of Israel towards this restoration and towards the, 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 the imminent 
reality of the power of God being dispensed into Israel. We are ministering that, and we've been doing that for a long time. That is sort of at the center, the epicenter of what God is doing today. It's, it, it is. God has turned his, his face away from Israel for chastisement and punishment, and he's turned his face towards the Gentiles. Israel has had its period of chastisement. Now, what is God saying to Israel? What, what is the word of God saying to Israel today? A light to the world? Right. Come home, definitely come home. Trust in God, God's, God's your salvation, your deliverer. And that's the word of God to Israel today. Now, our little church, we, we've been doing that consistently for 45 years, 40 years, and there are benefits. There, we can see the fruit of it. It might seem like nothing, but this is, the, this is the epicenter of what God is doing today. So, I've seen it over and over and over. Whenever someone comes into the ministry and they determine to get in the way of that, he pushes them out. He does, just about every time. Fortunately, I haven't seen someone killed. But I've seen where God would purposely say, no, I've given you a ch an opportunity to be congruent, to fit in, but you've insisted, no. Now you might say, okay, I'm set free, it's a good thing. All right, but you might have been called to quite a bit here. You might have been called to be really functional and an important part of what God is doing, and because of your self-will, your unwillingness to yield to God and to become congruent with what he's doing, you're no longer a part of it. So that's kind of the story with Ananias and Sapphira, but God wanted to create a, a really obvious uh, deterrent, because that was a deterrent. When Ananias and Sapphira died, it was a deterrent that you should not get in the way of what God is doing. All right, so this happened, and this was not, again, not something we like to talk about, but, you know, I think I, I heard the pastor of uh, Calvary Assembly a long, long time ago, Ruttenberg, Rutland. I heard Rutland preach on this, uh, a couple of messages, two or three messages on this. Of course, he was bold, and he didn't, he didn't mind much in upsetting people, and he preached on this, and, and it was powerful, but it's absolutely relevant. God will create deterrence uh, for people who are insistent upon getting in the way of what he's doing. So this is, this is, so, all right, so the church is growing in power. The church is expanding, beginning to, to, to sink its roots deep. So that's that second portion there, right? The church is, is, is empowered by God. Now we're looking at the expansion of the church and the inclusion of the Gentiles. So that actually begins right about in verse 9, actually, chapter 9, excuse me. Uh, actually, it begins before then. But the period where the church is empowered and begins to grow and, 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 and begins to establish itself comes to an end in the book of Acts. It never comes to an end, actually, but it comes to an end in the book of Acts uh, around chapter 6. Now, during this period is when the church begins to experience all kinds of persecutions. They were imprisoned, right? Chapter 6, I think it was, is where some of the disciples were, some of the apostles even, and disciples of Jesus were taken to prison by the leadership in Israel. Uh, they were released, and this, this went on for a time until ultimately the persecution really ramped up and Stephen was stoned. So now the church now is being pushed. People are being killed. Pe people are being martyred. And uh, the church now is really beginning to become uncomfortable in Jerusalem and beginning to move out. It's at this time that Peter moves away from Jerusalem. So there's a lot, there's a lot unspoken, or a lot that we don't know, that we don't see in the book of Acts as to why Peter left Jerusalem Jerusalem 
and he was no longer the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, no, no longer the leader or the pastor. Uh, but what, what, can we, what can we deduce? What can we conclude? That as the persecution begins to mount on the church in Jerusalem, Stephen is stoned, people are being put into prison, that Peter leaves, and he's now an apostle to Gentiles. He's traveling. He's no longer stationed in Jerusalem. What can we, what can we deduce from this? Hmm? Okay. So more than likely, the Holy Spirit spoke to Peter and maybe John and some of the apostles and told them it's time to go out. So, from my experience, having God's interaction in my life, is it, from my point of view, is it possible that God used the reality that conviction, that, uh, that, that, that persecution had descended upon the church to convict the believers to go out? Maybe they were becoming too comfortable in Jerusalem, and that was not God's purpose because shortly thereafter, Jerusalem would be destroyed. So he was preparing them, prepping them, so to speak, for diaspora. So some persecution comes, a couple of disciples are killed, James, uh, and suddenly you have the disciples going out. Peter. And this, is, this, this begins that category in the book of uh, in the book of Acts, where we begin to see the expansion of the church and the inclusion of the Gentiles. God, of course, Jesus always intended that Gentiles would be included, that the church would expand outwards. He said that before he ascended. So persecution here is being applied, and it's being used by God to drive or to push the church external. Of course, that leads to what we see in Acts chapter 10. What happened in Acts chapter 10? We'll talk, about the, we'll talk about that here in a moment. But God is using the persecution to expand the church. A good example of, of that is Paul, or Rabbi Shaul. Rabbi Shaul, who, is, who became Paul. How do you say Paul in Spanish? Pablo? Pablo. So Rabbi Shaul, who becomes Pablo, pa Paul, he has this incredible experience on the road to Damascus. Who was Rabbi Shaul? Well, he was a persecuting factor. He was one of the persecutors of the early church. In other words, he was being used by God to drive the church out into the diaspora. Believers from Jerusalem had fled and had gone as far as Damascus, and other parts of Syria and other parts of Asia Minor. And it wasn't enough to drive them out. The, the, the uh, leadership in Jerusalem wanted to get out there and persecute them as well. And so this is who Paul is. He's doing his bidding as a good Pharisee. He's, he's working himself up in the corporation of the Pharisees. And then suddenly he has this, this incredible uh, revelation of Jesus on the road to Damascus, right? We all know the story, uh, his Damascus road experience. What happened? This is in Acts chapter 9. What happened? He had a, what's referred to as a Christophacy, a powerful Christophacy, one with power. Many people have had Christophacies. What's, what's a Christophacy? A visitation by Jesus. Jesus shows up. Many people have had them, but not like Paul. Paul's is a little different. Paul's, Paul's Christophacy is with power. It, it shakes it, it rocks his world. It's so powerful that the soldiers, the, the armed men that were with him, also experienced something. What did they experience? They heard thunder. They, they saw the manifestation of God's power. They didn't hear the voice of Jesus. But they, they certainly were exposed to the power that God revealed his son in. What did Jesus say to Paul? Paul, Paul, why do you prick, we kick against the pricks? And Paul responded and, and, and so on. What did Paul say? Who are you? Who are you? 
and, and there was a discourse between him and Jesus. And then, of course, Paul has this incredible born-again experience. It's in uh, Acts chapter 9. Maybe we should read some of it in Acts chapter 9. Why not? It's, it's good. So Acts chapter 9, how much are 1, 1 to 20, chapter, chapter 9, 1 to 22. This is the conversion of Paul. This is Paul's Damascus Road experience where he goes from being a, a persecutor of the church, uh, an instrument that's being used by God to drive the church out. Uh, God had mercy on him. God had a plan for this rabbi, and God intersects him, and he has this incredible transformation experience. He's also filled with the Holy Spirit in this experience. So let's, let's do some reading. Let's, let's, uh, let's divvy up the reading. Uh, Acts chapter 9. Someone read, if you would, 1 to 9. Someone else read, if you would, uh, 10 to 15. Anyone? 1 to 9. Meanwhile, Saul was very impressed with He was eager to destroy the Lord's followers, so he went to the high priest and requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was nearing Damascus on this mission, a brilliant light he fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, sir? He asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go to the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men of Saul stood speechless with surprise, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but they saw no one. As, Paul, as Saul picked himself up off the ground, he found that he was blind. So his companions led him to the, by the hand to Damascus, and he found that he was blind. Oh, I got off that one. <laughs> he remained there blind for three days. And all that time he went without food and water. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. Or did I say that right? Yep, yep. Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision called Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, Go over to Street Street, to the house of Judas. And when you arrive, ask for Saul of Tarsus. He's praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying his hands on him so that he can see it. But Lord, this time Ananias, I have heard about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And we hear that he is authorized by the leading priests to arrest every believer in Damascus. Is that where you want to stop? Okay, why don't you But the Lord said, Go and do what I say, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, and, and as well as the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer. Mm -hmm. All right. So, Paul has a ministry, and... The ministry here is disclosed to Ananias before it is to Paul, but Paul's already having visions. His actual vision is taken away from him, but he's having visions. Uh, Jesus, Jesus appeared to him in a vision and told him about Ananias. And he's, so Jesus is interacting with Paul for these three days. What was happening to Paul during, this, during these three days? He was having a come to Jesus experience. Uh, wouldn't eat, wouldn't drink, so he was just taken back by, by his experience. But God was interacting with him and, and prepping and preparing him for what he must do. Now, his ministry is outlined in verse 15. I'll read it over again. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles 
and kings and the sons of Israel. So here is the ministry of Paul in a nutshell. To bear the name of Jesus directly to the Gentiles, primarily to kings also, and also to the sons of Israel. Now we know that he had, he had accomplished all three aspects of his ministry. Of course, the greatest, the greatest aspect of that mentioned is his apostle to the Gentiles. His ministry to the people of Israel was marginally successful. He had success in some places, some places they stoned him to death. So, well, actually, the Jewish people didn't stone him. He was stoned in, in, uh, in, in Greece, in Athens. But by and large, the Jewish people, they rejected him. Some accepted what he was saying. Some wanted to hear more about it. But his actual ministry was to the Gentiles. He did testify before kings, right? King Agrippa. Uh, so, so we see that Paul, what Paul was called to do, was actually fulfilled by Paul. Jesus said, in verse 16, I like, For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Could we say that Jesus wanted him to suffer because he was Paul? No, because all of the apostles suffered in the same way. So the, the sufferation, if, if that's the word, the suffering of the disciples or the apostles would be for God's glory. And Paul suffered for God's purpose. Now, Someone else, if you would now, read for us 17 to um, 22. Anyone? So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days, and immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is indeed the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed. Is it just the same man who caused such devastation among Jesus' followers in Jerusalem, they asked? And didn't he come here to arrest them and take them in chains to the leading priests? Saul's preaching became more and more powerful, and the Jews in Damascus couldn't refute his proofs that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So, Paul's ministry is off with a bang. And he's ministering and, and he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul's baptism experience was quite powerful. His, transforming, his transformative experience, his being born again experience was, was, you couldn't get more born again than Paul was, right? In a space of three days, he went from being Rabbi Shaul to Paul. Paul. Powerful transformation filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, he, was, hey, he had already been a well accomplished Pharisee. Uh, he, was, he was a student of Gamael, who was a, a teacher of teachers, right? And he was on his way up, and suddenly everything's pulled out from under him, and he's powerful, blind, but then fills with the, he's filled with the Holy Spirit, and he becomes this powerful servant of God, an apostle to the Gentiles primarily. Now, when we get back from break in about 20, 15 minutes, about 20 after 9, we're going to begin to talk about something here that's incredibly, incredibly relevant to us as people of the nations. And we're talking about Cornelius and his household in, in Acts chapter 10. And we're going to see here that their experience was one of power, immediate, where the baptism of the Holy Spirit was profound. They all began to pray in tongues as they received the Holy Spirit. And this is the model for the building of churches. And we have to take it in that context because that's the context under which this first Gentile church, the church of Cornelius and his household, came into existence. You see, the point is, and this is the point I'm going to make when we come back, is that what happened on, on, the, on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, 
happened at Cornelius' house with the band of Italians that were there. Maybe you descended from them. Who knows? <laughs> the band of Italians that were there, they all had their Pentecostal experience. They became a church at that time. Just as with the church in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, they became a church at that time as well. So we'll, we'll read that and talk about it when we come back. Um, uh, who Simon the Tanner, not Peter, Sam, Simon the Tanner, who lived in Jaffa, right? So Jaffa was a little community there uh, south of Haifa. Haifa, um, Haifa would, have, would have existed in that time. And so uh, today, north of Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv did not exist in biblical times. Uh, there was a tell there, so there was some sort of a community there, probably uh, Philistine and Canaanite originally, but it became Tel Aviv, all right? So north of Tel Aviv today is the region of what, what was Jaffa, where Simon the Tanner lived. And so what happened? In Acts chapter 10, Peter is at the house of Simon the Tanner, which is in Caesarea. It was also called Caesarea. So let's, let's talk about this whole narrative that we see here. I'm just going to read a little bit from it. Acts chapter 10, now there was a man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort. Cohort, a cohort was a group of soldiers who worked together. So the, the group called the Italian cohort, a devout man and one, of, one who feared God and with all of his household, with all of his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. So this Cornelius was what's referred to as a righteous Gentile. The, the, uh, the, the, the reality of the righteous Gentile has always, always existed since there's been a Jewish people. Certainly Cornelius is one. He was righteous. He prayed to God. He gave alms. He supported the Jewish people. So, so to some extent, he, he knew God. But he also knew of Jesus. Clearly, he would have because he was a centurion. This is, uh, this is some years following Jesus. Uh, Jesus' crucifixion, and resurrection, and ascension. So naturally, he knew the story. The Romans were the ones who witnessed it firsthand. So the, the word of uh, what happened in Jerusalem with Jesus would have been well carried about among the Italians. And fixing his gaze, oh, wait a minute, I need to back up here a little bit. <laughs> okay, so uh, pray continue. About the ninth hour of the day, he, he clearly saw a vision of an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius. And fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your arms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now, dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. He is staying with a tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. This is in Joppa, by the sea. When the angel who was speaking to him had left, he summoned two of his serv servants uh, and a devout soldier of those who were his personal attendants. And after he had explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. So, uh, God appeared, well, in an angel, as an angel, God appeared to Cornelius and said to him, there is a man by the name of Simon Peter who is at the house of Simon the Tanner in Joppa, which was south of, of, uh, of, of Caesarea, Go there, uh, there's something for him, right? So the angel didn't explain exactly what would happen, but, but he was to go meet this Peter. On the next day, they were on their way and approaching the city. Peter, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. So the sixth hour, what time is that? Yeah, noontime, we believe, noontime. And he's, he's up on the housetop of Simon the Tanner, and he's up there to pray. 
But he became hungry and, and was desiring to eat. But while, while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. Now there's some, some debate, I guess, about this. He fell into a trance. Did he, did, he, did he sleep and have a vision? It didn't say that he fell asleep. He was waiting for the food to be prepared, and then he had a vision, or he, he was in a trance. And he saw the sky opened up, and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds in the air. A voice came from him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Again, the voice came to him a second time. What God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. This happened three times, and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. So why did it, why did it happen three times? Perhaps Peter didn't receive what the angel was saying to him initially. I can identify with that. I've had that kind of experience myself. My issue was I was quarreling about eating... Uh, eating veal, and the Holy Spirit had to quicken me three times about not eating veal. So that's a whole different story, and it's very real to me, and I would not touch veal. I've been, in fact, I've been convicted several times since then about eating veal. So Peter now is being, being led to have interaction with Gentiles. The God is using the animal, the unclean, unclean animals, as a type of, of the Gentiles. So in Peter's mind, he, he compares eating swine, eating lobster and shrimp, with interacting with Gentiles. And that's why God is using uh, the unclean meat as, as a, an analogy for Gentiles. Now, a lot of people say, well, it's right here in black and white. We can eat pork and we can eat shrimp. Well, that's not what's being communicated here because later on, Peter himself will confess that God was using that vision to illustrate to me that the Gentiles are clean. Unclean animals are still unclean. You know, Jesus didn't come to save the swines and the lobsters and the shrimp. He didn't come to make them clean, in other words. Uh, he came to make us clean. We were far off as Gentiles. We had no part in God and in his kingdom. And because of the cross, we can be clean before God. Again, not the pigs, not the lobsters. Right? He didn't die on the cross for the lobsters and the pigs. So, again, a lot of people uh, debate this issue. You know, we can eat unclean. That's, that's an issue. That's a whole different focus, but I can touch on that quickly by saying, whatever you do or don't do in regards to food or anything you do in the kingdom must be done on the basis of faith, right? Romans chapter 14, Paul himself addressed the issue very clearly. He said, one is weak and will eat. One is strong and will not eat. But whatever you do, let it be done by faith. If you eat or don't eat, do it in faith. What is faith? Hearing from God and obeying. So, all right, so that goes back to the veal issue with me, right? It's very, very connected, the veal issue. Or what's the veal issue? Okay, so one night I was teaching Zemach in Torah, in Torah, and the, I think I was, we were teaching in the book of Leviticus, where, where it says that you shall not boil the calf in its mother's milk, all right? And, and so on. Well, the Jewish understanding of that is that you should not eat a cheeseburger because that's dairy and meat. Shall not boil a calf in its mother's milk. And that's what the Jewish people understand. That's what they do. I, I gained a different understanding. And my understanding was the statement about not taking a calf or boiling a calf while in, while in its mother's milk is simply that. You don't take an animal that's under a year. Now, in the sacrificial order, you're not to take an animal that's under a year. Only a yearling and above is to be taken because that's when the animal 
cease to nurse, right? That's when they, they what's it called, the gestation? Lactation. Lactation period is over. After a year, you can offer an animal as a sacrifice or to eat. By the way, when you offered an animal for sacrifice, it was for consumption. It was for consumption. Right, so um, only the whole burnt offering was not for consumption. The other offerings were for consumption, right? So you were not to take an animal while it was lactating. And that goes back to what God said. Do not take an animal while it's in its mother's milk. So that's how I take it that we're not to eat animals that are still nursing. Think about, think about it. Why, why would that be? Why would God ordain something like that? He did it with the sacrificial order, and he also came right out and said, do not boil a calf in its mother's milk. Because he's a merciful God. He's a merciful... Listen, God never, from the beginning, from the beginning, never ordained that animals should be eaten or sacrificed. What happened? The fall. The fall happened. And from that time forward, animals, God instructed man to eat them. All right? He himself offered the first sacrifice. God himself offered the very first animal sacrifice. So he shed the first blood. But he's God. He can do it. <laughs> So, so, so the point is, concerning an animal that's, that's in lactation, I began to teach this. I began to say, well, what God was really referring to in that statement was not that you shouldn't take a, a, a calf and boil it in milk, not that you shouldn't eat a cheeseburger or something, or have a good uh, zitzi pie with meat and good cheeses, what God was saying is be merciful and don't take an animal while it's still in, it's still in the process of nursing. So I was teaching that quite a bit. And so I went to Publix one Saturday. I had a brand new grill and I figured I would get some steaks and grill out. That was my thing at that time to do. And so I went to Publix and I looked in the freezer and they had these wonderful packaged meat. The meat was pinkish, red, it was huge, it looked tender. So I looked at it, it's, it's veal. I've never had veal before. I wonder what this would taste like on a grill. I, I bet it's great on a grill, tender and nice. So I, 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 I snapped up about four packs of them, I threw them in my cart and I head down, I head down the aisle. And I just swooped them up and, and I'm down the road, I'm ready, I'm ready to get some coals and barbecue sauce and head on home. And as soon as I head down the aisle, the Holy Spirit said to me, put them back. I just, boom, out of nowhere, put them back. And I knew he was talking about the veal. I'm like Peter, I guess. I said, what? No, that's, that's not the voice of God. That couldn't be. So I kept going. About two, two seconds later, two or three seconds later, put them back. So now I stopped. I'm like, I turned around, I went back to the freezer. I took the packets up and I put them back. And I went on. I went down the second aisle and then I said, you know what? I'm going to, I went back right to the freezer, picked them up again, put them in my cart and head down the same aisle. The third time he said, put them back. And then the realization occurred to me that this is veal, and that an animal, the, 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 the calf is taken as it's born. It isn't even given an opportunity for lactation. They literally, within hours of the birth of the animal, they thump it over its head and they, they butcher the animal and send it out for, as veal. They feed them only milk. They cannot move for their whole lives. They're milk fed. That's why the, the flesh is so nice and pink. It's disgusting. I couldn't, I couldn't, I stopped eating veal. So I, I spoke to someone who said that in, in, in veal, they take the animals right away. They take them and they cruel. It's cruel. So there is no mercy in that. No. So here am I, I'm preaching that, that this is what God is saying in regards to animals and milk, 
and I'm grabbing, I'm just snapping up all the veal I can get, and I'm really excited about it. Well, the third time is when all of the quickening, all of the understanding came to me, and I said, wow, okay, I get that. So I put, this, I put the veal back, and I went and got some steaks, and went home, and I grilled. So for me, veal is not, it's not unclean, but it's unkosher, it's unholy to eat veal for me. Why? Because I preached it. I, I provided an insight and revelation on something I believe God said, good, that's good, that's good, solid teaching. Now you're going to practice what you preach. And I had to, he, God was very clear, I had to put that veal back. I had to put it back. So, so for me, to eat, to eat veal would be sin. Because by faith, I proclaimed it, and by faith, I received it after the third time <laughs> that I shouldn't eat veal. So Peter is kind of in the same place. Peter had to hear from God three times to know that God was actually saying, go interact with Gentiles. But Peter, but Peter was pointed to unclean animals. He's not saying that you should eat unclean animals. He's saying you should interact with Gentiles even though you feel the same way about them that you feel about shrimp and lobster and escargot and swines and rodents. Yes, rodents is in the same category as swines in terms of food. He's saying to Peter, go minister to the Gentiles. That's how much the, the separation was between the Jewish people and the Gentiles. First of all, Romans. I mean, these are the arch enemies of Israel. I mean, Peter grew up on the Galilee hating Romans, right? I mean, dreading them, hating them, wanting to see them completely destroyed. Uh, and here now, the Holy Spirit is leading him to minister to them. This is unclean from his natural perspective. But God has a plan. So the, these, these servants of Cornelius is on their way to Joppa. Now, verse 9. On the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up, so we read that, became hungry. He said, no, Lord, let, let's, let's see where we are. Uh, get up and eat. And Peter said, never, I am unholy. All right, so verse 17. Now, while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision which he had seen might be, Behold, the man who had seen, who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions for Simon's house, appeared at the gate. So the Holy Spirit is punctual right at the exact time that Peter is grappling with this. Here comes these Gentiles. So God's on time every time. And calling out, they were asking whether Simon, who was also called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was reflecting on the vision, so this is happening in real time. He's reflecting on the vision, and these Gentiles, these Italians, are standing there calling out to him. And while Peter was reflecting on the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. But get up and go downstairs and accompany them without misgivings, for I have sent, for I have sent them myself. So the Holy Spirit says, Have no misgivings. Just get up and go with them. <laughs> so Peter is having this experience where God's doing a quick and profound work in him. The vision, the animals, the unclean animals. The, the three times the, the, Holy, the Holy Spirit spoke to him. Now the Gentiles are right at the gate. The Italians are right at the gate. <laughs> now let's read on. Peter went down and met and, uh, to the man and said, Behold, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for which you have come? They said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of Jews, was divinely directed by, the, by, the, by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear a message from you. So he, invite, so he invited them in and gave them lodging. And on the next day he got up and went away with them, and some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. On the following day he entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them 
and had called together his relatives and close friends. So this is the nucleus of the church. Cornelius, his close friends, and his relatives. He has them together. Something big is about to happen. Cornelius is sort of chomping at the bit. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped him. Cornelius is worshipping Peter. But Peter said to him, Peter, but Peter said, but Peter raised him, excuse me, saying, Stand up, I too am just a man. As he talked with him, he entered, the, he entered and found many people assembled. And he said to them, you, yourself know, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. So he didn't say God showed me that I can have a pork sandwich with a shrimp cocktail. That's not what he said. He said, the Holy Spirit has showed me, has illustrated to me, that I should not call any man unclean. So we can take it from that, that Peter didn't go out following this and buy himself a nice 15-pound ham. He continued to be the man of Israel that he always was, right? That is why I came without even raising an objection when I was sent for. So I ask for what reason you have come, you have, excuse me, you have sent for me. Cornelius said, four days ago to this hour, I was praying in my house during the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in shining garments. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your arms have been, have been remembered before God. Therefore, send to Joppa and invite Simon, who is called Peter, to come to you. He is staying at the house of Simon the Tanner by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come. Now then, we are all here present before God to hear all that you have, that you have, been, uh, that you have been commanded by the Lord. All right. So there's an anticipation that God has anointed Peter. They're just chomping at the bit, like I said. They're just wanting to hear what this is all about. Uh, they know something, something big is coming. Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not, a, a, God is not, God is not one to show partiality. The King James says God is not a respecter of persons. I kind of prefer the King James. Uh, but most certainly I understand now that God is not one who shows partiality, but in every nation the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. The word which he, had, which, the word which he sent to the sons of Israel preaching, preaching peace through Jesus the Messiah, he is Lord of all, you yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee after the baptism which John proclaimed. So he acknowledges that they all understand exactly what has happened. No one who was stationed in the land of Israel was unaware of the incredible story of Jesus and his disciples. You know that Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of, these, of all these things he did, and uh, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he, that he be, become visible. Not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God. That is, to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly and testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God to judge the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in, in him receives forgiveness 
of sins. So Peter is, is doing his spiel. He's preaching. He's a preacher for sure. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. Now, this is where many Pentecostals would go off with the opinion that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is signified by the gift of tongues. This is actually the only place where they would arrive at that conclusion because the evidence of them being baptized in the Holy Spirit is that they, they prayed in tongues. Let's read on. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter answered, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized, who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did. Can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus, the Messiah. Then they asked him to stay for a few days. So, wow. Peter is amazed. He's perplexed that this, this is happening. The Gentiles are crying out to God. And so he's there. He's preaching Jesus as the Messiah. Basic, basic message. He is the Messiah. God provided him for the forgiveness of sin. Uh, the blood atonement, perhaps. He's preaching every bit of it. And as he's preaching, the Holy Spirit falls out in this group of Italians. Now, it doesn't say if the entire house was then filled with the Holy Spirit, but it seems like that's what happened. And suddenly, they're all praying in tongues. And that, as the Jewish believers were saying, they were, they were amazed that the Holy Spirit had come upon them, and the evidence there being the gift of tongues. All right. So, the idea is that from that, from that position, we can take what we can take the position that the Pentecostals take, which is the evidence of you being filled with the Holy Spirit is that you pray in tongues. They would go further with it beyond that, and they would say, your salvation, the reality that you're saved, has to be manifest by you receiving the Holy Spirit, and the sign of the, you receiving the Holy Spirit is the gift of tongues. So they've concluded that without the gift of tongues, you're not saved. The gift of tongues is the evidence that you are saved. So this is, this is a very, even today, a very, uh, a very rigid Pentecostal position. Now, I wouldn't say that all Pentecostal churches adhere to it. There are many independent uh, Pentecostal churches, assemblies, and so on. But the true hardline Pentecostal churches, they still adhere to that. That if you, don't, if you do not pray in tongues, you're not saved. Yes. Um, the question that I have is back in the night. Uh -huh. uh, can you can you um, compare the contrast between Ananias reading Paul and Peter um, reading Cornelius? For example, because Ananias, I don't know, Ananias said that he was a disciple. So was he a Gentile disciple, or he was he was a Jewish? Disciple who went to war. So he was already. Ananias uh, was a disciple of Jesus. Uh -huh. So he was a Jewish? He was Jewish, yeah. Okay. So, so he already knew about the Holy Spirit and everything because he said that. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently he was a full fledged anointed disciple of Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Ananias knew God and the Holy Spirit, uh, wasn't taken back when God spoke to him. He, he interacted directly back and forth with God and the Holy Spirit. He mentioned how this, this Saul is a murderer of, of, of our people, people of Israel, did, because the church was exclusively Jewish at the time. Um, and so, yes, Ananias was Jewish, and he was, from, the, from what we see here, a believer in Jesus, a disciple, a Christian, so to speak. Um, he was hesitant about Paul because he knew that Paul was a persecutor of the church. Uh, but God used Ananias uh, powerfully 
to bring Paul to a place of, uh, to be an instrument of healing and, and, and the baptism because it was Ananias who put his hands up on Paul and, and Paul received the Holy Spirit. Cornelius was a centurion. He was a, a soldier. Uh, he was probably like what we would call a sergeant in the Roman, um, the Roman cohort group of soldiers. Uh, but he was righteous. He, was, uh, atten- he attended synagogue, no, no doubt. He was, uh, he was faithful before God. He, he, he called out to God. He wasn't a Christian. He wasn't you know, baptized in the Holy Spirit. He wasn't Jewish. No, no, no. Cornelius was a Roman uh, pagan, but he began to turn to the God of Israel. He was what's called a righteous Gentile. And he had this full-blown baptism experience together with his household. And uh, so this, this is what happened. Now, later on, to counter the Pentecostal position, later on, Paul would encounter the believers at Ephesus, a group of Gentile believers who lived next to the synagogue, but they were believers in Jesus. They were baptized in Jesus. So they were believers. And Paul said, had you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And they said, we haven't even known about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So Paul said, well, let me lay hands on you. And he laid hands on them, and they all received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and began to pray in tongues. So there you have believers who were baptized in Jesus, saved, quote-unquote saved, uh, who had not received the, gift of the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And this was, this was actually about four or five years. Actually, it's longer than that after the uh, Pentecostal, the day of Pentecost. So you have believers who are in Jesus, baptized, but hadn't received the Holy Spirit until many years later when Paul laid hands on them and they all received the Holy Spirit. Paul himself said, not everyone has the gift of tongues. That's what Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And he certainly didn't, he certainly didn't imply that if you, if you didn't have the gift of tongues, you're somehow going to hell. He said, not everyone prays in tongues, and it's fine. He says, it's better that you prophesy than you pray in tongues. So the whole issue of tongues is important, uh, but in many cases it's important because of the mess that the Pentecostal church has made with the gift of tongues. Literally, you're not saved if you don't have it. That's just wrong. I would, I would encourage everyone to pray for the gift of tongues because you need it. Now, I'll put it to you that way. Uh, I, I need the gift of tongues. It is an essential gift in my life as a believer, and I would encourage everyone to have it. <laughs> and to pray for it, I'm not going to condemn you into receiving it. That's the problem with the Pentecostal church. All right? So, so next week we will take it from here. And we'll begin to look at the ministry of Paul, but we have to look at what happens as more Gentiles come into the church and there begins to be a pressure between the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers. And that leads to a bit of a schism. What's a schism? Drama. A bit of drama in the church. And, and actually, Paul had the opportunity to address it but more so Peter. Peter was the one who sort of closed the argument at the Jerusalem Council concerning the Gentiles. And next week we will look at this. Okay? So have a good week and continue reading in the book of Acts. If you can get to the end of the book of Acts, it will be great. Have a blessed week.